daylight savings, how the practice of turning forward our clocks results in greater stress, more accidents, and even more heart attacks and suicides. That's coming up after the news. Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Courtney Morris. She's an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. Hi, Courtney. Hi, Sonali. 30,000 Iraqi and other troops have laid siege to the ISIS-held town of Tikrit and have already claimed a measure of victory. The U.S. has avoided joining the fight, presumably because the Iraqi-led ground forces include Shia militias and Iranian soldiers. At the same time, U.S. airstrikes and Kurdish ground forces in an area north of Tikrit have apparently freed a major route between Tikrit and Mosul from ISIS. If Tikrit is successfully retaken, the next major front in the battle with ISIS is likely to be Iraq's second largest city, Mosul. A similar collaboration between the U.S. and Kurds has liberated some Syrian in towns and villages from ISIS. Also in the news is a 19-year-old Palestinian man with an Israeli passport named Mohammed Saeed Ismail Musalam, who was the latest victim of ISIS brutality. The Islamic State, claiming Musalam was an Israeli spy, released a video showing a child executing him with a handgun. Musalam was apparently recruited to join ISIS forces, but then accused of spying for the Israeli intelligence office Mossad. Courtney, is ISIS losing the fight to create an Islamic caliphate, and all, are they also losing the propaganda war? Well, I mean, I definitely think what we're seeing here is just how unpopular ISIS is in the region. Um, and, you know, in the West, I think we've tended to focus largely on the deaths of Westerners at the hands of ISIS, and we tend to overlook the fact that the vast majority of their victims are other Muslims uh, and religious minorities in the areas that they occupy. Um, and, you know, they're, they're brutal, they're violent, and as we're seeing with the use of child soldiers, I think that that's going to lead a lot of people to become very loath to ally with them. Um, and so, yes, I think that their popularity is diminishing, and there's a real sense that they need to be contained. But I think that effort's also going to be really dependent on the ability of the various groups, Sunni, Shia, Kurdish forces who are involved to work together as a coalition, and also for the U.S. to play nice as we're going through these nuclear negotiations, uh, to play nice with Iran, because they've been hugely instrumental in working with Iraqi and Kurdish forces to contain ISIS. So. Right. We shall see. Right. Uh, and then President Obama here in the United States this week signed a student aid bill of rights aimed at easing the growing burden of student debt nationwide. The order he signed will force lenders to more clearly disclose debt to students and work with borrowers to enable a clear and reasonable repayment plan. Addressing a group of students at Georgia Tech yesterday, the president said, quote, we're going to take a hard look at whether we need new laws to strengthen protections for all borrowers wherever you get your loans from. Currently, a whopping 40 million Americans have student loans, and the struggling economy has pledged huge obstacles to repayment. The total amount owed by students is more than $1.3 trillion. Well, Courtney, it sounds great for the president to address this huge problem, but does his so-called student aid bill of rights actually lighten the burdens on students? Oh, well, it, it does and it doesn't. I mean, for example, in some ways, uh, for particular kinds of borrowers, for example, people with permanent disabilities or who can prove undue hardship, this measure would allow them, it would increase their ability, it would ease the process of them being able to uh, relieve their debt by declaring bankruptcy, which currently is quite difficult to do. Um, so that's positive. On the other hand, it doesn't really do much for the average borrower who, you know, may be carrying upwards of $30,000 of student loan debt. Um, it, you know, that it doesn't really help them, but it does make the process of acquiring and repaying debt a lot more clear and transparent, which, you know, in the end, I think if people really know and understand what they're taking on, they're very likely to take on less debt. Um, so in some ways it's good, it's positive, but, you know, it, it, it leaves a lot to be desired. I'm repaying student loans and I had to teach myself how to read my student loan bills because they were so complicated. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I think that's positive. It's a welcome but a limited step in the right direction. Right. And finally, in the latest in the Ferguson, Missouri scandal, city manager John Shaw announced his resignation last night. The news comes a day after Missouri's Supreme Court announced the new judge would take over the embattled city's municipal court. Both the city manager and the municipal judge were among those named in a scathing Justice Department report released last week, pointing to rampant racism and corruption among city and law enforcement officials. Courtney, while it's great that there has been a bit of a shakeup, at least near the top, the mayor, James Knowles III, is still in power, and no one's actually been criminally charged, have they? 
No, they haven't. Um, although it is looking very like the DOJ is going to be reorganizing the police department in Ferguson to some extent. Um, Attorney General Eric Holder has made it very clear that he is prepared to dismantle, completely dismantle the police force in Ferguson if that's what it takes to address uh, the structural inequalities in that department's policing practices. Um, and it, it might be exactly that that's exactly what it takes. I mean, we've seen uh, Ferguson and city police officials refusing to accept the findings from the DOJ report, uh, claiming that the results are biased and overblown. And so I think this really calls into question whether they are the people who will be able to enact these reforms that are necessary. Um, so I definitely foresee more departures um, will come, but will anyone go to jail? Probably not, uh, but they should because they broke the law. Well, as always, I want to thank you so much, Courtney, for joining us, and we will talk to you again next week. Bye, Sonali. Courtney Morris is an assistant professor of African American and Women's Studies at Penn State University. After this short break, we'll take an in-depth look at the Justice Department's report in Ferguson with my guest, Jody Armour. We'll be right back.